it was interesting in how I got into games because I, I actually recently applied for the UEA Creative Writing Masters right before that. Not because I felt I had to do that in order to do a novel, but more just the horror, I was deleting everything I was writing. I, I felt like I needed some kind of structure to force me to do something or I'd face get told off by teachers or something. I needed that structure <laughs> back. And um, so I applied for and, and I got in to the course, but I had to wait two years just based on when I applied and versus the application cycle. It was about two years, just under. And I ended up going into video games in the interim while staying to do that. I mean, I, the city I was in had a big gaming industry and I befriended people. And, and there's these events in game called Game Jams, where you spend 48 hours just making something that you release for free. And they're often horribly broken and not very good. But it'd be interesting to see what kind of writing a novel's version of that would be. But lots of people collaborate in different disciplines. And so I met a lot of people and they thought I was pretty good at my writing. And then I sort of, based on that, started getting work and releasing my own things. So yeah, I, and then went to UEA. I actually had, I had worked on a novel before this, before 16 Officers, that is, I think the agents got quite excited when I mentioned that there was like this whole other novel that existed, but like, no one will either get to see it or would want to see it if they did get to see it. <laughs> In that there, there was a lot of good stuff about it, but it was very... It, pro I probably used the word uncharitably to my past self, which is the word pretentious, in that there were a lot of good ideas going on in it, but I had quite a lot to learn, I think, um, as we all still do. Uh, but I'm going to try and like, smuggle ideas from that and lines into other things <laughs> throughout time, and it will live on in other forms. This kind of evolved in quite a weird way as well with your Breaker's Yard kind of um, comparison in that I started writing this kind of very unfocused... And I think creative writing courses sometimes when you, you've got to do a certain amount each week lead to this kind of miscellaneous material being produced that all relates to something. But and I, I wrote these stories relating to this town of Ilmarsh in the novel um, that were going to form a novel, but it was very unfocused in what the novel was going to be about beyond like bad. And I think to be honest, in some way, not to say my novel is unfocused, but in some ways the, the final novel is bad stuff happens in this town of various kinds. And that was where it came from and evolved. And I'd recently watched again, I'd, I'd seen it when I was younger, but I'd watched Picnic at Hanging Rock, Peter Weir film, and that really gave me a kind of big push towards the kind of tone I was going for of the eerie events and how they affect, technically criminal events, but how they affect the people left behind and so on, and the people trying to figure it out. So I was being influenced by all that, and I wanted, and there were all going to be all these different plot lines and different stories going on, kind of this weird kind of gothic horror middle march. Of, of different stuff going on and I wanted some kind of a set up event that I was going to make one of the plot lines throughout the novel but would have the tone of something of a kind of opener for that kind of thing and the, in in kind of horror but also in a lot of myth as well you often have some kind of omen often involving animals that starts off a kind of sent into the communal madness of, of the things and I wanted some kind of animal omen to, to set everything off and so I rewrote the initial scene without actually knowing precisely, or I, I think I had ideas, like they'd find a bunch of farm animals dead or something on this farm, a policeman and a farmer. But I decided to take a left turn with it in the initial conception of, of thinking about horses as similar to farm animals in some ways, but also very different in our kind of social treatment of them and the economic value of them. And a lot of themes that relate to the novel is similar enough to hit the spot I was going for, but weird enough to be slightly strange. In that, for example, if they found a bunch of cows dead, it wouldn't have battered, it would be less impactful for some reason. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and that, that led to the initial idea. And then the novel, that plot line, and when I came up with that, I figured out the rest of the plot line where that was going to go. But then talking with my class and going through all the ideas, they suggested that perhaps my kind of incredibly complex novel that was probably going to be like a thousand pages long of all these different things, they just said the horse thing is really good. Why don't you just do the horse thing? And dial back the other ideas and initially I was super I didn't even come up with the name 16 horses myself someone else just said why don't you just call it 16 horses and I had I can't remember what the title was but it was a super pretentious title and I, I was I went up to a bunch of people and I was like without telling which one I came up with I was like here's 16 horses here's the other title which one's better and everyone just said 16 horses so I faced defeat and I was like okay <laughs> I'll I guess I'll do this plot line that you're enjoying instead of the ones that I guess you're not enjoying and then yeah and 16 horses was born as a result of of the winnowing down process of the ideas. So the novel deals with, in terms of things, I'm not personally, I'm not a policeman and I'm not a veterinarian or a veterinary surgeon. One thing that was quite useful in the, because for those who don't know, the two main characters are 
probably just so I just said a, a policeman and a veterinary surgeon who's helping out the case. My fiance is a veterinary surgeon and was training throughout the last years and now is practicing ones. Charlotte, who the book is dedicated to, and my and some of her friends were very useful in some initial questioning about a lot of the last few years has been spent asking various people. So if you were going to kill 16 horses, how would you do it in, in, to, to, to lead to this result? And it got refined over time and various other elements because I just, the, the mythic nature and the kind of cool nature of that did lead to certain issues in terms of feasibility, in terms of that being a quite difficult thing to accomplish. But that was quite an interesting journey in terms of the research to find that all out and led to quite a lot of plot developments altering as a result of the, and, and becoming better as a result of the, the truth behind that. I was working on that throughout the time. I contacted a police, an ex-police detective consultant who'd worked for, for a few other authors to look through the manuscript. He was really useful. He approached it from the perspective, not of pure realism of like method, like how, it's more like, how would you make this plot work with relation to police plausibility, which is a great approach. And, I recommend to any writers out there who are thinking of getting someone that's a far better approach than changing the plot line completely. Um, or... I'm used to him as well, actually. So I, oh, I think, great. Yeah, I, saw, yeah he I, was really great. I think in the acknowledgements, I was like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was really helpful. And uh, yeah, and that, that was good. And it was a lot of, uh, for example, there was a thing about, I, I suggested policemen have been let go from the local area, whereas a better way is they, they would be made like sh there's ways of getting rid of police people which isn't it doesn't involve firing them and, and little things like that i wouldn't have known and, and naming and stuff there wasn't too much in terms of actually operation in the book that was a difficulty which was very good because I was, I was getting a bit worried about that and with regard and the approach i've always had regarding research or things i don't know about is to i'll do enough reading and enough looking up to feel comfortable with the topic but then I think I'm the kind of personality who would endlessly search for stuff if I decide I had to do my research before doing it. So I'll do the writing and then I'll make it work or rewrite or replace if I have to, but I won't try and do it all before because I'd never be satisfied with that. And with the veterinary elements, I had a recommendation from my partner as to a veterinary forensics. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, so I, sorry, I did one extra thing. I, this was quite weird. I went to a training weekend for veterinary forensics people, which had vets there and police officers and you could just go i think definitely i was not it was so useful and that one of the cases they discussed was the beheading of a horse which was extremely lucky for my weird regard purposes but there was quite a lot of visual imagery of stuff that happened to animals and there's one thing to read about it although some of the initial kind of amazon comments just that maybe it's not one thing to read about it in terms of people's response but it's one thing to read about that's another thing to see visual images of what the yeah. aftermath is so i was sitting there pretty queasy and agitated the entire time but very useful in terms of getting a feel of how this is all done and and, and in terms of how it's all investigated and what the procedures are and so on and then i got i asked an expert afterwards to look through the manuscript to see how it was and it turns out my partner and her friends were all quite good in terms of their initial stuff. There were just a few rearrangings and she gave a compliment. It's like, you seem like you know a lot about this stuff. I'm like, oh. And um, and then we refined it and uh, she provided a lot of kind of fine tuning on. So there's a lot of autopsy and post-mortem scenes that have quite a lot of specific detail. And, and I already had a lot of that, but she added a lot more detail and she really augmented how to kill 16 horses <laughs> from a uh, procedural standpoint which was which was helpful and because uh, I must say a, a thing throughout kind of development with regards to editors and or agents early on was there were there were a few initial questions about feasibility and not a single review since the book went on net galley in its final form has queried what the, the the procedural logistical elements of the whole thing so I feel like that was mission accomplished in terms of getting authority from the research because I totally thought all these reviews are going to come out and I'll be like how did this happen whereas it, it does it seems to be now a kind of explained stuff thing <laughs> Chapter six, the tent shook in the storm, barely holding up against the onslaught of rain. Already water leaked into them, coalescing near the head of a young mare, a chestnut colored horse who had been called Sally. She had been our owner's best friend. It was hard to see any of this. There were no street lights, not this far from town. If you stood in those fields that night, you would not have been able to see anyone, even if they were standing right next to you even if they were looking right at you. You wouldn't see their gray hooded gas mask. You wouldn't see their tight rubber gloves. 
it is a beautiful thing to be seen. Stars dead for millennia kept faith. They walked out into the night. I was really worried it was way too on the nose calling a place Ill Marsh. So that's an evil town or something would be the, the name. But but I, I did a look um, <laughs> looking into it. I noticed a lot of places in the UK do begin with ill and then some first places end with marsh. So it's a combination yeah. name. It's not an inappropriate a place could be called that. So I was happy with that. And yeah, in terms of the there was a review from Publishers Weekly recently that that talked about and it was it was one of those nice reviews that kind of gets various bits you're going for and yeah. Because sometimes there are nice things, there are reviews that like things or don't like things, but then there's reviews that specifically state some kind of cool thing that makes you sound cool, but you're like, oh, I did mean to do that, which is a nice coincidence rather than something you, you didn't actually intend to do that people give you credit for. Um, but it, it talked about um, the novel being yeah. about the poisoning of a place or about, and it's people, but in like a lot of different yeah. ways, and which is, is true yeah. without giving too much away on various levels. That's quite true. And throughout time, rather than in a particular moment, the novel, I wanted a big sense of history to Ilmarsh, and actually they were originally in, in an earlier draft that was, there was this kind of middle draft between various drafts that maybe some others, other authors do, which was, it didn't go off on one, so to speak, but it did have a lot of kind of chapters that I think were described by someone as almost like, they were good, but they were like short stories or related kind of spin-off short stories almost, um, relating yeah. to the place and characters, which I think I might one or two of them I actually feel like I should have left in actually respect more I'm thinking about it especially for tonal variation like there was this one there's this character in the book called Louise Elton who helps run these stables and there was a whole chapter of her the, the, there's a hint in the town that what happens to it after such events transpire and what's happened to horses goes more widely that they almost merchandise it in that it was supposed to be an old tourist town and there's this whole chapter where she's pretty much like staring at some horse cupcakes in a shop and then goes in and buys them and then there's some interactions with other people with her and it goes on quite well but I thought I thought it was quite good actually respect like the horse cupcake thing but uh, yeah there was I slightly just gone off on a tangent here actually even like the draft I was writing I can't entirely remember why I started talking about this elephant I have to admit <laughs> um, give me a second Relates. So, what was the original question again? Sorry, I'll, I'll find it. So again I was in a asking second. about the, the setting and, and oh yeah, the, yeah. So yeah, sorry. So there were a lot of there were various chapters that were going to go into the history of the town as far back as there was, and I think there are some references to it in there still about the fact it was bombed in World War Two, the economic history, in fact, Norse pottery is found. But there were going to be some chapters that were actually like brief, like the one I just read, but were going to be set in those time periods, getting closer and closer to the present, and some elements like survived as well so there's a reference to this uh, thing called the dancing plague uh, which one of the characters analyzes because they find the phrase in a note and it was this amazing thing i found which never really happened in the uk but across europe and various other places there were these epidemics throughout the kind of from about 1000 ad to about a couple of hundred years ago where people just mass start dancing spontaneously and we start one or two people and there'd be loads of people dancing uncontrollably and it was, there were so many of these things occurred that they started trying to prescribe medicines for it. And one idea was to try and get music. They actually got musicians in to try and like play to the crowd, to get them to dance to the music. And they like slow them down with the music was an idea, which I thought was amazing. It didn't really work. They just, various people in each of these incidents either collapsed or died essentially because they were just dancing nonstop for days. But I was going to have a fictional one had occurred a few hundred years ago in this town, for example. And, and so I was, I was wrapping up a lot of his almost like a, a pick and mix of weird historical incidents that were all real, but were going to contribute to this kind of place in the present. And so a lot of the sedimentary layers of that survive in the novel and that there are allusions or references to it, which I, hopefully I feel like give, makes the place feel lived in. And, and some people have asked, oh, is that a real place or, or think it's a real place? And a lot of them have described particular county locations in the UK, like various people like, oh, is it East Anglia? Various people think it's somewhere to the north. But I feel like that's a good sign in terms of people are registering it as if it's as if it has some kind of um, reality to it. And then similarly, I visited various locations to try and get a sense of that. So my parents, these are all nice places. None of them are like, gosh, it's horrible made up place. But my parents lived near the broad stairs, the Ramsgate kind of area. And they... So visiting there, they've got a seaside location and there's a lot of kind of walks along the beach, which are quite empty. So sitting there, you get with hardly any people around. You can get like a really good feel of everything. And in particular, during the UEA course, 
the Great Yarmouth is very near Norwich. And I visited there a few times off season on very rainy grey days, first time by accident. Um, it's really interesting going to a tourist town when no one's there. It's a terrible day and it's not designed for it. And that you get a lot of feelings that you wouldn't get if it was a nice tourist day. And you can imagine a town that's always like that and draw from that. And especially the image in the book of all the arcades with all their lights on, like a huge rose, is true of Great Yarmouth. And I don't really, I did slightly steal one thing in the book from someone in that I was going on and on about how it doesn't make any sense. Why are all the arcades open when no one's inside them? And as a, I'm not saying that this is true <laughs> legally about that. This is just what someone else said. And so in my fictional town, it's true. This is not a statement about the real life arcades. But someone said, oh, it could just be money laundering. Which I decided to just steal, as is, I'm sure that's not the case in real life for these arcades. But I was like, oh, that's actually a good explanation for a kind of fictional town. So there's a kind of hint that all is not economically well. And, and there were a lot of avenues I could have explored with that that I didn't in the end. But um, hopefully makes it feel real and that it feels almost like I could have or, or I did in an alternate draft and it's cut. The, the, yeah. the, the cutting is visible. So. Yeah, so, so that line does thematically relate to far more than just the horses, you know, which I hope becomes a cross and so on. It, so what happens right prior to that is the, the, the essential conceit of the novel is I'm treating a crime against animals as if it's like a crime against humans, so in that the police are investigating it, which often doesn't really happen, to be honest. And the, so the farmer, I think, has referred to what happened to the horses as if it's a murder, and then I like the main policeman responds, uh, it's, it's essentially property damage. So it's not even like a, a, a crime against, in terms of how the law technically treats it, there is a kind of cruelty against animals. But even then, for, for cruelty to be proven, you have to, you can say that certain animals died without necessarily having been cruelty to them. And it, cruelty is what matters under the law for kind of worse punishments as opposed to just you're killing property. And so to take, someone's dog or cat as is happening a lot at the moment is, is essentially theft you know something in between human abduction and theft it's just theft and so we treat a lot of animals legally as if they're objects or possessions and the line you can decide in that context you can do anything if you decide something as a human is, is something that's not even untrue in that they're not human but with various animals in a way that's a bit weird we attribute different degrees of what well, i guess human humanness to them in that dogs and cats are treated far more socially as if they're in our human kind of venn diagram of things we consider to have feelings than for example lambs or sheep which although sheep will if you walk near them they'll probably just run away if they're in any way tamed or raised around humans the behavior of lambs and young sheep is is not that different to some to to some pet animals we just don't act like they are because it's, it's weird to you know it's uncomfortable for a lot of different reasons yeah um to treat that way and so yeah there's a lot there's a lot there about that but it also extends to people's treatment of each other in the story on a kind of literal level with some kind of because it's not too much for hints of this quite strongly the blurb if not saying it outright in that it starts as just being about animals but goes on to to involve humans what's going on and has already involved humans for a while but becomes clear that it's not just about animals and so the, the treatment by certain characters I'm serious, um, of, of, of stuff is just not treating people as if they're proper people but also to some extent people are socially treating you know, from outside this town they're treating this town as if they're not people in terms of the economic treatment of them and othering and the yeah. kind of importation of because um, of, of people from outside communities to fill up abandoned buildings and so on uh, which is the thing that happens in real life and kind of economic marginalization of, of everyone involved um, there's also a lot that relates in in terms of the inter this is more subtle but there's a lot of the kind of intercharacter relationships that are involve othering so with the without spoiling the direction too much it goes the, i was interested in having a, a main male and female lead you know that kind of main one detective's a man one sex woman and almost flirting with certain tropes that would normally have in a police procedural story in terms of certain expected personality types you might think 
or that even a question of, and I think someone very early on, you read the manuscript said, oh, is it going to, are they going to get together? Is it a will they, won't they thing? And I won't spoil the direction it goes, but I was very conscious of what reader expectations might be purely based on, and, and I find myself doing this with TV shows as well. If you see two attractive people that are both leads, you wonder for some reason automatically based on the genre, like what will happen with them? And so the idea of family relationships and also romantic relationships or kind of interpersonal relationships, gendered relationships and so on, quite important to me in terms of, uh, and there's a very early question in the novel about where the main character, Alec, and it's designed to partly show that he's not the kind of average character you'd have in this role, where he asks, do people even like me? And he's very concerned about people's opinion and he's very neurotic. And his neurosis comes clear as the novel goes on to quite a large extent. But there's a certain gendered quality, to be honest, to Alec's view on the world. And that initial quote doesn't entirely just apply to the horses. To, in Alex's perspective, it also applies to the people he interacts with. And he would never think of himself as othering or, or treating people as, as less than full people in his mind. But a lot of stuff about his life that comes with the story and it's quite important. Alex's history is quite important to, to, to his character arc in particular. Is, is It links into that line. In a way, I obviously can't really go into any more detail without spoiling it. But there, there was, yeah, I, I think humanness of oh, humanity in that way is, is, is something the story is very concerned with. Um, I've been very vague about it. I, it's not, nothing's announced or anything, but I, I'm working on, I'm about, I've reached a point in which I reached with Six and Horses, and I think a lot of authors reach this, the kind of 30 to 40,000 word juncture where everything slows to screeching halt <laughs> after kind of various things with a, a new book. It's different in, in quite a lot of ways to 16 Horses. It has a character in common. So there's a character in this that, that's in that, though otherwise it's a separate story. It's slightly genre shift as well, and that the other one is um, Six and Horses is very much police procedural with a lot of twists to it. This is not so much a police book, but uh, and, and has quite a different um, relationship with time as well. So it's a kind of dual, not a dual timeline thing, but one of the, the half of the book is, and that cuts between is in the present day and the other book is in the past, which is quite fun to play around with, to, to do a, a different time period as well. So there's a lot of stuff I'm having fun with. And I, I did say to myself, I wanted to make sure I didn't repeat myself with what I'd done in a previous book. But yeah. annoyingly, I think I lost anything I would have gained in terms of, oh, I know how to write a book now. Oh, this will be easy this time. Whereas deciding to do different stuff is, oh, okay. I guess I've just lost all the information. I've just got to learn all this new stuff. Um, and yeah, so I'm working on that. And I, I keep having ideas for other things that I've been tempted at various points to try and do instead. But uh, as, as I've heard from other writers, to try and be suspicious of that impulse, especially at this juncture where I've suddenly slowed down in the middle it's kind of, I imagine if I started one of the other things, I'd be tempted to just, I, I'd probably just slow down there and have all these kind of 30,000 words. <laughs>